So, Father, we thank you, Lord, today that we're able to come together as your people, God. And, Lord, we ask that you'd speak to us today with your word, that we'd be changed. For your word does not return void, but it accomplishes what it's sent forth to accomplish. So we ask you, God, to speak to our hearts and change our lives. And all God's people said, amen. 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 So today I want to talk to you um, with a prophetic, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a prophetic message today, okay? A prophetic message from the scripture really um, has to do more with types and shadows that we see in the word. Prophetic messages will highlight the principles from the scripture, okay, and relate those principles to what you're experiencing today. So we see principles outlined in the scripture that we can relate today. Prophetic messages, God reveals hidden truth to us through situ- situational parallels. Sometimes you read a passage and there's a parallel that relates to our life today. You hear what I'm saying? And so we want to look at that situation parallels. We see the patterns of God. How many know there's patterns of God? There's numerology. There's all this stuff in the Bible. And the Bible is an exciting book. You know, uh, the youth group here on Wednesday night, Chris got up and did a great message. And he, he, he opened up by saying, listen, the Word of God is so exciting. There's so much, there's so many layers of revelation in the Word. Amen. Was it Friday night? Friday night. <laughs> And that's what I find with the Bible, uh, that, that even the names of places and the names of people, as you're reading, if you study the names of the places God sends people, there's hidden truth in those names. How many know what I'm talking about? And so the, the Bible is so supernatural. It's so incredible. We're going to start today in 1 Kings chapter 16, uh, chapter verse 29 to 33. Okay? It says here in the... Uh, 38th year of Azah, king of Judah, Ahab the son of Amri became the king over Israel. And Ahab the son of Amri reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Next verse. Now Ahab the son of Amri did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Say more than all who were before him. So he, w- he was not a good king. He was an evil king. And uh, go to the next verse. It says, and it came to pass as, uh, as uh, though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethabal, king of the Sidians, and he went and served Baal and worshipped him. And I've talked in the past about Baal worship, all of these pagan religions, and, uh, and, and this is who Jezebel worshipped. She worshipped Baal. And so this was a great sin, and it provoked the Lord. Now let's go to the next verse. Then he set up the altar for Baal in the temple of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a wooden image. Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all of the kings of Israel who were before him. So Ahab was a bad dude. And and, and he did more to provoke the Lord of Israel to anger, okay? And um, here's the first principle I want to give you if you're taking notes, okay? Okay. As the leader goes, so goes the nation. Say it with me. As the leader goes, so goes the nation. That's why it's so important that you vote. How many know it's, we, we, can, we, can, we can let our voice be heard at the ballot box. And so many people don't vote. Listen, as the leader goes, so goes the nation. And so let's read on. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 to 3. And Elisha the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew or rain these years except at my word. And what happens here, here's here's something we need to understand, is sin in the land will cause spiritual drought. And when Ahab decided to sin against the Lord, when he provoked the Lord to anger, when he rebelled against the commandments of the Lord, there there was a drought that happened. Elijah said, listen, there's going to be no rain in the land. We're talking about physical rain. And there's going to be a great drought, and the rain will only come at my word. And when there's sin in the land, it will cause a spiritual drought. Verse 2, And the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward. And hide by the brook of Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And I find this very interesting because the Bible says here that God told him to hide. The word of the Lord came to, uh, came to the prophet and said, listen, I want you to go hide yourself by the brook. 
How many know that there's seasons and times in our lives when we're called into places of hiding? Times when God wants to build us up and God wants to nourish us. This is what's been happening in the church. We'll get to that in a minute. And I think this word here, it's very interesting because God could have sent him to any brook. God could have sent him to any river. But he says, I want you to go to, the, to hide at Cherith. And Cherith actually means from the Hebrew, it says a cut. It's the root word, the root word to covenant. He says, I want you to go to a secret place where you can draw from the covenant that I have with you. We're in covenant relationship, and I want to take you and hide you away in this place, and and I'm going to take care of you there. Israel is experiencing drought. The nation is experiencing drought, but Elijah obeyed the word of the Lord that came to him, and he was taken away to a secret place. Sometimes when there's sin in a nation, sometimes when, when there's evil in a nation, God's, there, there's a spiritual drought. The presence of the Lord, uh, and the Bible says the Holy Spirit brings the uh, conviction of sin. How many knows in years past that the conviction levels have dropped in our society? And so God has called the church away into a place. We, we go into the local church. We gather together. There's a place that God has called where the presence of God will come and fill us. Look at in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 4. And it shall be, he's talking to Elijah, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. See, God had had enough. And he said, listen, I can't do anything about the nation because as a leader goes, so goes the nation. And they've made some decisions that, that it's going to cause a spiritual drought. But I can take care of you. And here's the second principle. Wherever the Lord's word sends you, he commands provision for you. Amen. Wherever the Lord sends you with his word, he provides provision for you. And as Elijah went to that place, the ravens came to feed him there. 1 Kings chapter 17, 5 to 7. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which flowed into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had not been rain in the land. And here's, here, here's something to realize. The ravens brought him bread and meat, And he drank from the brook because God was bringing provision. Here's the next thing to notice. After a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. And I want to draw a parallel here because I believe, and the Lord spoke to me when I was preparing this message. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, "There's there's been a drought in the land for 30 years. In Canada, in Ontario. And I'm sitting there trying to, I'm trying to prepare my message. I keep hearing 30 years. It's coming up in my spirit. 30 years there's been a drought in the land. And what happens when there's a drought in the land, God takes his people and he brings them to Cherith. He brings them to a place of covenant. He says, I will feed you there. I will bring nourishment there. The the water always symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. And so just like Elijah received the water from the brook, it nourished him. Just like Elijah received the meat and the bread from, from the ravens, it fed him. And when we come to the local church... Something shifted in the realm of the Spirit 30 years ago where the presence of God lifted off the public sector and he sent the church into hiding, into a place of preparation and a place of, 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 of feeding and a place of nurture. Because And what was happening is you'd go out into the workplace, you'd come to church, you'd experience the presence of God, you'd experience the word of the Lord, you'd feel filled up, and then you'd go into your workplace and it was like there was a drought. You'd go into the public sector and there's a spiritual drought. How many know what I'm talking about? And it's like you go and share the gospel and people aren't hearing it. They're not receiving it. You say the name of Jesus and you're going to lose your job. And it's like there's a drought and people are thirsty and people are hungry. But you know what happens if you stay at the brook too long? Eventually, the drought in the nation gets into the church. That which was nourishing you dries up, and you're standing alone. And that's what's happening in local churches today. The world's getting into the church. The dryness that's in the world is starting to get into the church. 
See, God has appointed seasons and God has appointed times for his people. Amen? In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8 and 9, it says here, say transition time. Verse 8, the word of the Lord came to Elijah again saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, okay, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Remember the second principle? Wherever the word of the Lord sends you, there's provision made for you. I have commanded you to go to this place. Zarephath will take care of you. So I'm going to do, do, do what did uh, the brook represent? covenant. Zarephath in the Hebrew means refinement and purging away. So God was saying to Elijah, I'm taking you from this place of intimate covenant with you where I fed you, where I've hidden you away in the secret place. I'm building you up. I'm preparing you. As a nation has rejected me, I'm preparing you for three years. And now you're going to go forth and you're going to go to the nations and you're going to bring refinement. You're going to bring a purging to the land. And so Elijah leaves that place, okay? And his next assignment, say next assignment, assignment. was to purge the land. And God commanded provision ahead of Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 10 to 16, it says, So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hands. He's hungry. See, the the, the food, the spiritual nourishment that was taking place for him at the brook was no longer there. He had to step into the obedience of where God was commanding him so that he could receive nourishment in his next assignment. And if you don't understand the transitions of God and you don't move when God says move, you'll find yourself in a dry place because God is moving to new things. And so let's look what happens. And so he said, as the Lord your God lives, I, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. I mean, talk about being at the bottom of the barrel. I mean, we got nothing. We're just going to take the last bit that we have. We're going to enjoy our last meal, and then we're going to die. How many have been at the bottom of the barrel? And, And what happens here is Elijah says to her, verse 13, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me, and afterwards make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry, until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. And um, verse 15, so she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for how many days? Many days. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. And Elijah asks the widow to provide for him first. And this really comes across as a selfish and arrogant act. Why would you, the woman is about to die and you're saying to her, give me first that I might eat. That's pretty selfish, right, in the natural. But in the spirit realm, he's demonstrating a concept that is foundational in God's economy. Put God first, finances will come in order, you will experience God's provision when you're in need, if you make a decision to put God first. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And you know what, the Lord rebuked me as I was preparing this message, he says, Travis, you never share with the church some of your financial struggles of the past. You've never shared some of the blessings that God has given you and your wife, and kind of rebuked me for that, so I said, I'm going to share a little bit today, is that Okay. This is a little side, this is a little bunny trail from our message. But about 17 years ago, I was making $17 an hour in Pickering, Ontario, and I was working as a machinist uh, in apprenticeship program. And 17 years ago, you could do okay on $17 an hour. I mean, it was, wasn't a lot, but it wasn't terribly sparse for us. So anyway, we were living on that. My wife was staying at home. She was going through to be a hairdresser. And the word of the Lord came to me to go to Trenton. Mother and father talked to me. We we're going to come here and plant a church. 
And so I found a job here at $11 an hour, part-time. So I'm about to move here, and I realize, listen, I need to buy a place or rent a place, so I'm not making enough to rent a place for uh, my wife and I and our son at the time. Um, we're looking for a mortgage, and the banks laughed at us. Banks laughed at us. We can't, we're not even looking at your finance. You're not making enough money. Why are you making, you, you're making seven, why are you going to making $11 now? How, how are we going to give you a mortgage? But how many know the Lord prepared a widow for Kimmel and I? The Lord commanded a widow to take care of us. And I'm not kidding. This is really what happened because my wife and I believe this concept. Camilla stood before me when I asked her to marry her. And one of the things she says, I'll marry you on one condition. I said, what's that? We tithe to the local church. Amen. We give God the first fruits. She said that. I thought she was going to say something a lot more romantic. But no. And I'm like, fine. Because I believed in tithing. I just didn't always do it. Sometimes I'd miss a day, I'd miss a little bit of money here and there. But it was very important to her. So I said, yeah, honey, sure, we'll do that. We'll tithe. And you know what? God is faithful when you put him first. And there were times when we were struggling and we couldn't make ends meet and it seemed like we didn't have enough. And we'd say, no, but we're going to put God first. We're going to pay our tithe first. Amen? And we did that. So here we are, we're about to move here, and I said, Lord, I'm praying, I'm saying, Lord, I said, your word says that if we, you know, if you tithe, you'll rebuke the devourer for our sake, you'll open up the windows of heaven. So Lord, your word says, try me now in this, so I'm trying you, God. This is the only place God says, try me. He says, Lord, I'm trying you. Father, I need a place in Trenton. And I run into a friend of mine, he's going through to be a youth pastor, and I'm training him, this is when we were pastoring in Oshawa still, and uh, he says, hey, listen, my grandmother... Uh, is part of this little United Church. It's just a small church. She's on the board member. She's one of the board members. And um, the pastor, she's a woman pastor. She's really sick, and they need someone to fill in and preach. Would you go? And I was like, really? They want me to wear a costume, you know, like a gown with a sash and, and all this stuff. I'm like, really? I said, I'm looking for, you know, I'm not used to that, right? So I, but I felt in my spirit, God says, go. I said, sure, okay, I'm going to go. So I, so I went out to preach at this little church, and I got up, and I could, did they put a gown on me? Honey, I don't remember. They didn't let me do the gown, but they made me read out of this, this booklet. So I had this book, and though I would say something to the congregation, and then they would repeat it. It was kind of cool, actually. That's why I do that when I preach today, right? So I'd say something, they'd repeat it. I'd say a scripture, they'd say a scripture. It was kind of cool. So, uh, so I said, I'll do that on one condition. Can I just free preach? Can I just preach the word? So, okay, you got 10 minutes to do that. So I did my little thing that they told me to do, and then I preached about salvation. It was great. Amen. So my friend's grandmother was on the board, as I said. She was a widow, and she really took a liking to me. And so we're about to move here. We're about to move here. The banks are laughing at us. There's no way we can get a mortgage. We can't even afford to, to, to get a place. I'm making $11 an hour, plus a bit of gas mileage for CAS. And, I'm, and there's no way in the natural that God can do anything with that. How many know there's no way? And my friend says, hey, I think my grandmother likes you. You should call her. I said, she's a board member at the church. He goes, yeah, but she's a millionaire. And she gives out money for mortgages. I said, really? So I called her up. <laughs> Say, hi, Shirley, how you doing? I said, my wife and I are going to plant a church with my parents in Trenton. The banks are laughing at me. She goes, how much money do you need? She goes, go find the house you want, and I'll lend you the money. I only have 5%. Oh, don't worry about that. The Lord wants me to bless you. So all of a sudden, we, get our first, we buy our first house, and it's a duplex, a three-bedroom, and a three-bedroom. It's a semi-detached. So we live in one. We rent out the other. This is 15, 16 years ago. The one side pays our mortgage, and I'm making $11 an hour. Two years goes by, the Lord speaks, the word of the Lord comes to us saying, you need to go to Kingston for a season. You're going to Kingston. Lord, well, Lord, what are we going to do? I mean, uh, we, uh, you know, I don't have a down payment. We're just scraping by. We don't have enough money. And I felt the Lord said, call Shirley. So I call Shirley again. Say, hey, Shirley, listen. The Lord's called. The word of the Lord has come. We're moving to Kingston. We're going we're gonna, to, we got to buy a house. And entry-level home at that time was 160000 or something. I don't remember. So we decide to move to, 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 to Kingston, and she goes, okay. She goes, what do, you, what do you want from me? I said, well, listen, I'm going to sell my property. Can I take some of my equity from the property I bought two years ago because the market went up a little bit, and can we go, we're going to go to Kingston. We'll put that money. She, she looked at me. She goes, listen, son. She goes, you got to make money. She goes, you keep the duplex, rent them both out, and I'm going to give you money to buy your next house. I said, Shirley, I don't, ha I don't have a down payment. She goes, I don't need it. I trust you. The word, if God's telling you to go, you go. She lent me the money for my third house or my second house. 
We were there for five or six years, and then the, 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 Lord, the word of the Lord came to me to start a business. And we needed a bigger house so we could run my business out of the house. So we had to buy a, a very expensive house for us. It looked like Noah's Ark. It was huge. And it had this big garage and, and so we could build. A, we had two big, big garages and uh, to could run my business. And so I'm only making, at this point, $14. Say $14 an hour. The Lord speaks to me. I call Shirley. Shirley wants me to keep my house and buy a fifth house. And I said, no, I don't want to do that. So, but here I was making $14 an hour, and I own four houses. Okay. Because the Lord will provide when you put him first. And that's not to tell of the times when we bought our house and someone showed up at the door because the Lord said, only spend this much for the house. We put in an offer. The lady shows up at the door and said, the Lord spoke to me to give you seven grand to renovate your house. We're going on vacation. People come in. Here's, the Lord told me to give you $900 to go on vacation. I'm telling you guys, this stuff works. And when you're faithful... With your first fruits, God blesses you. Amen. I was making $14 an hour. The Lord said, you need to go into business for yourself. I went to a business course to learn how to run a business. It's a six-week course. And in my third week, I was already making so much money, I could hardly go through the course. First month I opened my business, I made five grand take home. From $14 an hour, which works out about $1,800 a month, to five grand. And it went like that. God blessed us. Amen. Amen? And I don't say that to brag because it had nothing to do with me. If you looked at my bank account, if you looked at, you know, my situation, and what, it, man wasn't blessing me. It was God who blessed me. Amen? And God will do the same because he's no respecter of persons. Amen? He'll open a door where there is no door. He'll just make a way for you if you're faithful. And that's why my wife and I are so big on tithing, and we won't force people to do it. But when people don't give, I don't sit there and go, we're not going to make the budget. I don't give a rip about the budget. I care about you guys, and I want to see you guys blessed. I want to see the windows of heaven open. I want to see the blessing of God being poured out on your life. Amen? Amen. Okay, that's enough about tithing. Okay. So Elijah leaves the place of covenant with God. And he has a new assignment. The new assignment is to go take care of this widow. Many people, they miss this. But he goes from this place uh, of being in covenant relationship, hidden away with God. He goes to the widow. And I don't know if you remember this, but her son is really sick. And he dies. So Elijah goes up to the upper room. Say the upper room. And he lays down on the child three times. And he says, Lord, raise this child. Lord, raise this child. Lord, raise this child. And the child comes back from the dead, and he carries the child from the upper room back into the, the main level. And this really shows you that the, the upper room is where the resurrection power of God is. It's going to be the church that realizes in that place of the upper room where the encounter of the Holy Spirit and the presence of God is real in your life. We're going to bring resurrection power into the world because God has called us to purge the sin that's in the land. Can I hear an amen? amen. And so it's transition time. Say transition time. Let's go to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1 to 2. We'll talk about the second assignment that he had. It was to raise the dead son. But the second assignment was here. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. No longer is there just going to be provision at the brook of covenant in the local churches, but now I'm going to pour out my spirit on the public sector again. So Elijah went and presented himself to Ahab because there was a severe famine in, in Samaria. Another thing happened in chapter 18 as Elijah left the place of his hiding to bring refreshment. He confronted the idolatry in the land. How many know that? How many know there was a showdown at Mount Carmel? Say showdown. Because he showed up and he built an altar and he said, listen, we're going to see whose God answers by fire. We're going to see if Baal has any authority in the realm of the spirit. Or are we going to depend on, is God God or is Baal God? How many remember the story? 
and they put the sacrifice and they drench it and they drench it and they drench it and there's water going all around it and he calls and, and, and the Baal worships are going around cutting themselves and doing all kinds of stuff and God does not answer but when, when, when Elijah opens his mouth the fire comes from heaven and yeah. devours and suddenly all the people who were in drought suddenly say the Lord is God the Lord is God yeah. amen and so we're living right now in a time the Lord spoke this to me, and you can take it or leave it. I'm not claiming. Time will tell. That for 30 years, there's been a drought in the public sector. And the Lord told me that in September, there's going to be a shift in the realm of the Spirit, and there's going to be rain that's going to begin to come, not only in the local churches, but it's going to happen in the public sector. And God says, you need to prepare yourself. Get the nets ready, because God's about to bring a harvest of souls into the church, not just this church, but in the churches in Ontario. And so the Lord is saying, 30, 30, 30, but where, where's all this coming from? Where is all this coming from? And as I was preparing this message, I said, 30 years. Why 30 years? Why did the presence of God leave the, 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 the public sector 30 years ago? And I heard it in my spirit, and I didn't, said, prayer was banned in schools. That's right. That's right. And I said, no, really? And I, I knew it was banned, but I was thinking, 30 years ago? So I Googled it. Okay, and I'm going to bring up a slide here. This is what I, when I Google it, it came up. It's a PowerPoint. It says this. A Jew, a Muslim, and a non-believer filed a lawsuit in 1985 under the Charter of Rights. This September marks the 30th year since a group of Sudbury parents had the Lord's Prayer removed from Ontario public schools. Philip and two other Sudbury parents won a decision saying the reciting of the Lord's Prayer and non-Christian children opting out by sitting in the hallway violated the Charter of Rights. Three years later, in September 1988, say September 1988, they won a decision against the Sudbury School Board, which had the Lord's Prayer removed from all Ontario public schools. And the Lord said to me in my spirit, and I knew it was God because I went into weeping and travail and I was crying. The Lord said what happened was when they rejected prayer in the schools, they rejected my reign over the nation of Ontario, over Ontario. And God said there's a 30 day, 30 year judgment, just like Elijah was three years by the brook getting refreshed, being hidden away. God has hidden the church for 30 years. And now he's about September, it will be 30 years, there's going to be a release of rain in the public sector. And there's going to be an openness to the gospel. Why? Because kids are so sick and tired. They've tried the religions of Baal. They've tried all the false religions and the psychics and all, the, all of the stuff you see on TV. And they're tired and they're saying, I'm not fulfilled. I'm not satisfied. And rain's about to come so we'll see if I'm a false prophet or not why 30 years I have no idea but I know that at 30 actually if you study in the Hebrew uh, is a time of transition it means a time of transition as one moves to his greatest strength from a time of growing strength that's what it means the church has been growing hidden away for 30 years now God's about to release Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And our court system betrayed Jesus. And now there's 30 years of judgment. And I believe that in my spirit. Time will tell if I'm correct. But it all came together and, and, and it just brought me to a, a serious place of prayer um, concern, concerning this. Did you know the cost of a slave from biblical times was 30 pieces of silver? Did you know that? In Exodus 21, verse 32, it says, But if the ox gores a slave, either male or female, the animal's owner must pay the slave's owner 30 silver coins, and the ox must be stoned. Jesus was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Amen? Amen. So something's about to shift. Something's about to happen. And I couldn't put my finger on it. And this is what came to me as... Um, that God is, is transitioning the church from a place of hiding. It's not a bad place. It was a place that God commanded. You need to be in a place. And so people would come to local churches. Amen. They come here. They go to different churches. And they'd receive teaching. They'd receive the presence of God. But then they would leave and they'd go back into the marketplace and say, you know, God's not here. But that's going to begin to change. That's going to begin to change. God's got some strategy. God's got some things that are about to happen. And this transition isn't a location transition. It's actually just a, 
uh, a transition in the way we think as believers. Because God wants us to begin to build bridges with the community. Amen? Relational bridges are the only bridges strong enough to carry the weight of truth. If you think you can go, especially to this millennial generation, to start preaching your beliefs to them without building a relationship, you're not going to get through to them. We have to love people where they're at, and as we share, let them share their lives and we share our lives, we can tell them why our life is so special because Jesus is central to it, and people will buy that because there's a hunger in the hearts of people. Amen? I'm going to close with this. How many believe the Lord shares his secrets with people? And this has been something I've been praying about for years because back in, when did we do World Impact Tours, Camilla? 2008, was it? It was probably 2008. World Impact Tours uh, is, is an organization out of the States. Um, and they come here, they go all over the world and they rent out stadiums and they have strong men you know, Ben bars and rip books and they got people on skateboards and they have dancers and they have, it's like a big production that they put on. It's very well done. And so what they do is they, they, they mass uh, advertise in communities, invite every, come to the, see our show, come see our show. And then after they do their performance, somebody gets up and preaches a simple gospel message and they have an altar call and everybody runs to the front and gets saved. That's the way it's supposed to work. So we did this in Kingston. There was much planning that went into it. We used the K-Rock Center, which seats 5,000 people. We did three, three uh, events. And um, what happened was um, my job, was I, got, I got a phone call from the, the House of Prayer. And they said, Travis, I want you to go from church to church. And you're going to preach and teach on how to do altar ministry, how to do follow-up, how to do discipleship. So they gave me some material. I studied it. And then I started going from church to church. And we did, a, it was like a Thursday night, Friday night. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting in front of, Seven of the major churches in Kingston, I'm talking about, this is how we're going to do it. So here's the strategy, guys. I gave them all the teaching. I said, what's going to happen? So they give the altar call. Okay, somebody's going to be sitting there, and they're going to get up to run to the front. And what you do is you eyeball them. You see them from behind, and then you follow them. And you, you come up and stand behind them. So when, when everybody says the salvation prayer, you say the salvation prayer as well. So they'll think you're there giving your heart to Jesus. Good plan. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And so when they turn around to go sit down, when you're standing behind them, you're going to put on a secret badge over your head. It's got a little. It's going to have your name. And you turn around, and you go, "Hey, I'm so and so, and I, I want to get you to fill out this card. We want to get some information from you, and I personally will contact you, and we're going to go for coffee, or we're going to hang out, or we're going to we're going to chat, and we're going to get to know each other." And, and that was the strategy. And then they didn't say this at the altar, but then I told them, once you meet for coffee, once you connect, bring them to your church. You don't have to bring them to my church or anybody. Bring them to the church you're part of. So that was our strategy. Pretty good strategy, right? Yeah. So we thought it worked really, really good. The problem is we had close to 700 converts. And it was amazing because the, the altar, they'd have the altar call, and all of a sudden you see all these people run forward, and most of them were preteens and teenagers. I remember Pastor Rick said the average age people get saved, 80%. The people that get saved get saved at the age of 14. So all of a sudden, all these kids, you know, did the altar call. All the kids run up, and all our workers are sitting like, you know, undercover agents sitting there, you know, like, hey, I'm going to get saved. And they run up behind, and they do their card. They fill everything out. And this works like gold in America. Didn't work good here. Because as my, all the 350 people that I trained started calling their people, they would freak out on the phone. The parents would pick up the phone and say, you know, we're nervous. We don't know who you guys are. And uh, we've had bad experiences. And, and, and you know, I just, this isn't going to happen. Click. Some of the kids would answer the phone and say, you know, my parents, you know, you know they're just really not comfortable. And, 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 you know, we can't really do this. So out of 600 people that got saved, we had three people get discipled. And I don't even know if those three are still serving God today. So, so I, I was broken, man. I started crying, God, you know, I've invested all this time. We want to see the harvest. How many know you get discouraged? I was getting to completely discouraged because where's the fruit of all this? We put all this. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, the public doesn't trust the church. And so you need to build relationship with the church, with the, with, with the community. And that's been on my heart since 2008, and that's why I know at our last partners meeting, which will be online, you can listen to it, 
is that we need to start to build a bridge with the community and do things that nobody's doing to reach people nobody's reaching. We cannot live in the shell called the church or the house of God. We have to go out into all the world. We have to have strategy. We need to have ideas. We need to know how to reach the millennials. We have to get into people's world, and we got to love them and show them Jesus so that they're willing to come to him, right? Because they love our message. They just don't understand our methods. Amen? Amen. And so God is about to do a great thing. And I think that's why God dropped it in my spirit, because I've been praying about that since 2008. And the Lord said, 30 years, and he said, prayer has been out of the school. And I Googled it, and sure enough, it's 30 years this September in which the time. So I'm believing that's a word from the Lord. Time will tell. But whether the time's right or not, maybe, maybe I missed that, but I'll say this. There is a time of refreshing coming. And there is a time that God is speaking to his church and he's saying it's time to leave. And if we try to stay within the four walls of the church, the, the, the brook will dry up and the dryness of the world will come into the church and the fire will disappear and the passion will disappear. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand and I'm going to close in prayer. Is that okay? You guys good? Amen. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that I get to be part of such a great family. Amen. Lord, I thank you that we're, we're all brothers and sisters. And Lord, we're just hungry for what you're doing. And Lord, I truly believe that we're moving in its transition time, that you're calling us to transition from just being in that place of that hiding place, that God, you're going to begin to open the doors. And many times we've wandered from the brook and we've tried and we've got discouraged, but now there's a new season for you have said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain that's about to come on the nation. I thank you, Lord, you're positioning each and every one of us in our workplaces, in our communities. Uh, I've already seen, Father, the, 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 the interest in the youth. All of a sudden, youth are interested in talking about spiritual things. It wasn't that way. There's a new day coming. Say, there's a new day coming. So, Father, we thank you that we get to be part of your plan. I thank you that you're going to command our provision wherever we go in, into our uh, uh, realm of influences, God. There's a harvest that's about to come in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen, amen and amen. God is good.